Like I may have to think more in an action where I'm doing a test and sure I'm like writing a bit, but like I'm more like, hmm, and I'm thinking in my head versus like a like me going to a gym and just pounding weights. Well, once you've learned something, there's a lot less need for mentalizing about it. The yep. first time you had to learn about it how to use different kinds of weights and number of reps and sets and all that. See, that was all conceptual. Again, it's all mind-based. Mm -hmm. But the experience itself, when you're doing it, doesn't have any distinction between that. When you're doing a movement, a rep, you're not busy thinking, oh, now I'm doing a rep. You're feeling the action. Right. Even though there is reps and sets going on. From the mental perspective, you can say so, but in your immediate experience of it, there's just the experience. There's not... A, no, there's just a feeling. Yeah, that's right. Just the feeling of the action. Because it's, like, it's not like you feel yourself... Like, how do you... Like, feeling, even trying to feel yourself think, that's just a sensation. That's right. How do you know you're thinking? You feel the thinking. Yeah. So and that's when, all there ever is. That's creepy. Well, that's that's the perennial philosophy, non-duality. Meditation is embedded in that perennial philosophy, which says there are not two. This is where the concept of oneness, as badly as it's understood and used these days, comes in. Oneness right. is not an idea that people have, like, oh, I'm an idealistic thinking we're all one. This is baloney. That's just mind chatter. Oneness isn't a concept, it's a direct experience of your own existence. And when you pay attention to, let's say, hearing my words, there's no two here. There's not me and you. There's just the experience of hearing. Yep. So in the Upanishads, there's a saying that the experiencer, the experience, and the experiencing are one. But if you think, wait a minute, I'm an experiencer and I'm having an experience and that's the experiencing, that you're gone conceptual again. The r direct experience of it, there aren't three, there's only one. Interesting. That makes sense. So um, when you're taking a test, of course, you're using your mental faculties, memory in particular, to equate those memories to concepts, words which is what a test consists of, mm -hmm. right? So, again, the idolatry of the age is the thinking mind. The idol is the thinking mind. And so, really smart people are either revered or reviled, right? That's, that's the idolatry of the thinking mind, and by God, that's a massive pathology. That's why people elect idiots like Donald Trump, because they're not feeling, they're thinking. They've narrowed their intelligence to an issue instead of the feeling, which is where conscience lives, by the way, and where foresight lives. Foresight isn't analytical. It's intuitive. Did I uh, answer that question for you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess a good way to... That makes sense. It's just the experience. That makes sense. Um, but... I can still use the the example of like the thinking mind mm -hmm. as a way to distinguish like like certain like that's more of like even though there's just the experience there are people that try to is it still okay to distinguish certain things or activities with like the thinking mind versus the non-thinking mind. Yeah, well, it's a faculty. There's a difference between using a faculty and being convinced that that is the, the reality of things. See, concepts are not the reality of the experience. They're merely a representation. The experience contains its literally infinite facets. Concepts extract a few of those facets. Right. Conceptual mind is always partial at best. Experience is always 
total and ineffable. And what that means is it can't be reduced to mind. And that's what ineffable means. It can't be reduced to mind. And everything is ineffable. But from the point of view of the thinking mind, people reduce everything to particular qualities or aspects. So let's use an easy example, say appreciation of women. Now some people will think, oh, I am an ass man or I'm a leg man, right? And they're reducing the woman to that, but she's obviously vastly more than that. Mm -hmm. Or these poor fools wouldn't get raked over the coals the way they do with some women, right? Mm -hmm. They've tried to reduce her. They went for the one thing that they've labeled as the ideal, and then by George, there was a lot of stuff they didn't take into account. If they're feeling... They'll still never be able to reduce it to concepts, but they will get stop and go signals that are felt. Same thing with conscience, same thing with foresight, same thing with intuition. So you might say it this way, words are digital, experience is analog. <laughs> what do you do with analog in order to record it? You reduce it to make it digital. So in CDs, such, it's 44,100 chops per second, which leaves out zillions of harmonics, which is why digital music sounds thin compared to live or analog music. And analog is limited by the effects of a 60 cycle electric current, so that's a digitizing also but it's got vastly more information in it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the continuous tone photo versus a half tone. You know the terms? Dots. When you look at a newspaper, the photos are all made of dots. Big dots, little dots. That's called, uh, that's the, it's called half tone. But if you look at a photograph, not the reproduction, it's all continuous tone. And if you look at the actual item that's being photographed, it even has more richness of information. So words are digital. They lose an awful lot. But people who are adherents to the idolatry of the mind think that's good enough, just the way people who are into technology think that a CD is good enough. They don't know that they're missing a lot of feeling from the experience because a lot of harmonics are gone. Right. Thanks.